I believe I'm going to start in on Jeremiah 17. This will be our review from last Wednesday's chapter 40. But before we begin our Bible study, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. The time to use the rebound technique if needed, which is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So let's bow our heads together for a few moments and I'll finish us out in a group prayer. Our Father God in heaven, we're delighted to have our freedom and be able to come together as Christians without persecution. We pray that you go forward with us in your word this evening. Make it a source of encouragement and also challenge. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week we studied the fact that Joseph be, he got out of fellowship by trusting in man. And he told uh, uh, the cupbearer, remember me. And uh, he began to trust in the wrong person. And uh, God, didn't, uh, God didn't agree with Joseph's move. And he let, he's going to let Joseph cool his heels for two more years in the dungeon because of him trusting in man. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 is a verse that I, I uh, used in reference last week. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 5. I want to start there with you. And we're going to make a, a few verses here in Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah says, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose right lobe departs from the Lord. And so, obviously, you want to live your life under blessing. That's the opposite of a curse. You want to live your life under blessing. That's the point. And um, what this verse is telling us is that we put our trust in God. We put our trust in God. And uh, we give man his due where, due where credit is due. In other words, you may, you may have some friends who prove themselves trustworthy. You may have some friends who prove themselves untrustworthy. And you take notes along the way, and uh, you, uh, you understand the difference. But what this verse is telling us is that if you put your trust in a politician... You put your trust in a crooked pastor. You put your trust into bad friends, social groups. You will be disappointed. And you are going to live under a curse. Yes, you will. And isn't it amazing that um, the, the mind of the socialist is... A, he, he, he's appealed... Uh, to a politician who says a lot, we're going to give you a lot of free things. And he's trusting in a politician for his prosperity. And uh, these kind of people ruin their countries in fairly short order. Uh, they're not Bible scholars. If they were, they would have read this verse. And they would have said, you know, it's wrong for me to plant my hopes in a man. And therefore, I'm going to follow what Paul says, and I'm going to pray that the government would stay out of my life and that I could live a godly life. He says that ought to be our prayer, that we have freedom to live a godly life. And isn't it amazing that all of the people pouring through our southern border have destroyed their own countries by, guess what? Not heeding Jeremiah 17.5. They've absolutely lived under the curse of socialism. And now they're going to bring the curse with them to America. 
Amazing. Here's your verbs. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. See, God is our strength. He is our high tower. He is our fortress. He is our safety. And He is the one who brings blessing. And when God brings blessing, no man can stop it. God will pour where He wants to. And the second half of the verse tells us it is the reversionist who places his hope in man and he departs. It says, whose right lobe departs from the Lord. That means you can't get him to Bible class. He doesn't want Bible. He doesn't want Bible study. He's going to go out here and do his own thing. Well, what happens to this believer? This is a believer. And the reason I tell you that is because Jeremiah was preaching to a nation of reversionists. And the fifth cycle of discipline was knocking on the door. And this was his, uh, his generation. What happens to this believer? For he shall be like a shrub. That's actually a, uh, one of those bushes that rolls through the desert with the wind. In the desert, a tumbleweed. And he shall not see when good comes. That means he's not stable. He's unstable. He lacks stability. But shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. See, dryness of soul. The ability, see, the ability to enjoy life, whatever it brings, is part of the super grace believer's life. Whether, see, I love summertime, and I don't know why. I love the heat. It does. I don't. I don't care if I have to sweat. I I thank God that I can handle the heat, and I can get in it. And I I actually think about some good times that I had while I was extremely hot. I'll never forget, we delivered STEM, which was a chemical that you sprayed on rice, and it was in 35-gallon drums, and we had a whole bob truck load of STEM, and we delivered it to the airport out at Open Banks, and there's not a shade tree in sight. As a matter of fact, they killed everything on this airport runway so that the crop duster could turn around, so it's just dry, and it's hot, and we're out there with... I don't know how many barrels of stem to unload. And so we get out there and we unload all these barrels of stem, and they're heavy. And uh, we're standing them up out there, and they, you know, they're getting ready to spray rice the next day, and that's where the crop duster reloads and takes off at. Man, we got extremely hot. But on the way out, I looked over in a rice field, and there was a spigot head. And if you've ever been in a rice field, you know what the spigot is. It's a big pipe coming out of the ground and it just showers water out to water a huge rice field. It's coming right out of the Washita River. It's been, been under three dams and this water is cold. And here I am super hot. I say, stop this truck. And I dove out under that spigot head with all my work clothes on. And I still remember that to this day. That was probably the most refreshing dip I ever had. I love hot weather, and uh, I'm thankful for it. Well, a lot of people can't say that, and the truth is, I'll probably get to an age one day where I won't want to get hot, or probably can't handle it. The super grace believer is able to have a good time no matter what the circumstances avow themselves. See, it's a blessing from God to have fun in the middle of possibly adversity. But the reversionist can't even enjoy good things. You see, hedonism says seek out that which feels good. That which brings maximum pleasure. 
But did you know under hedonism, there's also a phrase called anhedonia? Anhedonia means that you can't get any satisfaction. You've made it to the point where even the finest things in life do not satisfy. And that's exactly what Jeremiah is saying. But he shall inhabit the parched places. It's the dryness of soul in the wilderness. In a salt land which is not inhabited. And salty soil can't grow anything. Salt is actually a poison for plants. And this means there's no prosperity. There's no growing. And it points to no spiritual growth. So it's quite the opposite. For the super grace believer can go through all the vicissitudes of life and come out the other side shining. He has a great time no matter what life throws at him. But the reversionist has the dryness of soul no matter how good he has it. He does not have the capacity to enjoy life in all of its different venues and categories. Verse 7, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. See, this is the opposite of verse 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope, confident assurance, is in the Lord. See, my confidence is in Jesus Christ. And when you look at all the pathetic governments that we have in the world right now, can you imagine how great it's going to be to live under the monarchy of Jesus Christ in the millennium? It is going to be absolutely awesome to see what a true and real government should be like. Amazing. Verse 8, the super grace believer, for he shall be like a tree planted by waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. I love it. He's got the nourishment. See, the, the river is Bible doctrine. The water is going to be soaked up by the roots through the function of gap. And the believer is going to put on new leaves, that spiritual growth. And the fruit of the tree is divine good produced. But its leaf will be green and not be anxious, anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. So that's even in the middle of national decline, which we may find ourselves in. We're actually in already. Doesn't matter. My prosperity is not reliant upon what the economy is doing. My prosperity is not related to the White House. My prosperity is not related to uh, any disease. My prosperity comes from God. And this verse proclaims it. And so we need to recognize in our own lives we must trust in God and we cannot put our hope in man. And that's a curse, see. The blessing comes from keeping our eyes on Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father in the place of power and authority. So that's why Joseph got himself in trouble. And uh, we're going to go back to our PowerPoint at this time. You may want to turn your Bibles back over to Genesis 40 now. And we're going to take on chapter 41. I had to get myself over there.
The other major point that comes out of chapter 40 is that God holds the interpretation. And while the dream was Bible doctrine or prophecy in uh, Joseph's day, we should recognize that we also have the interpretation of Scripture with God the Holy Spirit indwelling us, our human spirit. Not only that, pastor teachers who diligently study the Word of God in the original languages. So I've been a uh, recipient of men who have done a bold amount of work in the scriptures and uh, obviously we have the interpretation now i want to begin in chapter 41 then it came to pass and we should recognize that god's plan is rolling like a great wheel and it rolled in joseph's day just at it as it is rolling in our day and when we see that uh, phrase it came to pass you should recognize that nothing can stop god's plan it will crush everything that it comes in contact with and nothing will stop it. And the point is, is that the believer in fellowship, the believer advancing in the spiritual life can ride in the cart and not be crushed by the wheel. Now, in God's plan, He's going to let Joseph cool his heels for two years because of his failure. And it's going to be two years of suffering. Then it came to pass. That means God's plan is rolling like a great wheel. At the end of two full years, that's how long God had, uh, had Joseph cool his heels, and he is going to learn some obedience. That Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by the river. And so we see that Joseph stayed two full years in that dungeon in order to learn the faith rest technique and in order to resupply his inner resources so that he would be productive for the rest of his life. He is fixing to take a huge leap in his personal life all the way from the dungeon to second in command in Egypt. And God has to make sure that Joseph knows, do not trust anybody else. It's me and you, brother, in this deal. And if you try to trust somebody else, you're going to be dismayed. You're going to be under a curse. You've got to learn how to trust in me. And so the faith rest drill is imperative for the believer's spiritual prosperity. In these two years, Joseph went from a tumbling weed in Jeremiah to a tree by the river. Jeremiah 17 gives the story about Joseph in those two years. He went from being an unstable believer to one of the most stable and dynamic believers of all time. We should see that this preparation for greatness and preparation for greatness always involves suffering. No one can be great apart from suffering. It takes suffering to become great as a believer. And it's not always physical suffering. It can be mental suffering, by the way. No believer reaches, mental, uh, reaches maturity without suffering. But the suffering must fall into certain categories. It must, be, uh, it must result in the use of the faith rest technique. And no believer can mature until he goes through often long periods of suffering and perpetuates the inner happiness and peace and contentment. So what you're going to find out is that there were no great leaders of the Bible who didn't have their era of suffering when you look at the life of Moses you're going to see that uh, man he spent 40 years as a shepherd and this is a great uh, blue collar job but buddy it's rough and uh, he is uh, it's hard work and there's nothing nice about it 
and he's going to learn some humility out there in the desert taking care of some knothead sheep. It's not going to be too much unlike him leading the Israelites. Um, you'll see that uh, Paul, he spent a little time cooling his heels after he got a little high-headed and went back to Jerusalem to take part in the holy days. Well, God let him cool his heels a little while after that in jail. And that jail stay wasn't, uh, it wasn't near as nice as some of the other ones that he had. And there were other believers. Uh, if you look at Jonah, uh, Jonah got a little high and mighty, and uh, he got to uh, cool his heels in the belly of a great fish for a little while before he got puked out on the beach. And so God has a way of bringing some humility into your life. And some of that is going to be through suffering. And the first thing you have to nail down is the fact that God absolutely needs you to be able to trust Him even in the flames of fire all the way up to and into death itself. Even if he slays me, I will trust in him. That's what Job says. David would write, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That means he was ready to walk right up to the gates of death and right through them and trust God, the faith rest drill, the whole way. Got it nailed down. It's only then when you have that kind of faith rest that you're absolutely solid in life. And I've told you many times, once you learn how to die correctly, then you've got a good foothold on learning how to live correctly. So we're going to take a few points on suffering and leadership. Suffering and leadership, this suffering, which is intense, demands the faith rest drill. It leads up to occupation with Christ because suffering is so personal and no one else knows your pain, see? But God does. And uh, it's impossible for um, someone to hurt with you or take away your pain so therefore it is very personal and uh, God is the only one who can see inside your life to know exactly how you're suffering and the intensity of your suffering this is leads to the highest experience in the life of the believer in 1st Peter 1 verses 7 and 8 And Peter tells us that through the trials, our faith is increased in being much more precious than gold. Now, I've been through some of these things in life, and it's amazing that the amount of anguish that other people can bring into your life and it doesn't always have to be physical suffering. Sometimes it can be dealing with opposite members of the human race. And you've got... See, here's the issue. It's easy to want to lash back out and to uh, have vengeance upon that person and to try to get them back or to ruin their life when they're trying to ruin yours. See, that's only natural. But what you have to learn is the faith rest real. And you have to learn promises like... Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I shall repay. And when you trust that promise and you say, okay, God, you take care of it. I'm just going to smile. You take care of this bully. I'm going to smile through it. I'm going to use my agape love and I'm going to watch you work. And you don't malign and you don't criticize and you don't gossip and you just let God do it. I have seen men destroyed because they attacked me. 
and I stay quiet. And it's amazing how God will work on your behalf if you simply let Him. He can't do it if you get out here and you want to punch somebody in the nose all the time and you want to get mad with them and you want to get your own vengeance and you want to malign and you want to criticize and uh, you want to uh, gossip. He's not going to work for you when you do those things. But when you pick up the faith rest drill and you trust in Him, see, He'll work miracles for you. And you stay quiet and you smile through it. Point two, in preparation for greatness, there must be power through suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, tell us that we cleave to God's strength. The bottom circle, the divine dinosphere is our place of power. God has to wean you off a of weak human strength, see, at some point. And the more hard-headed you are, the greater the suffering. So I want it, it behooves you to learn how to cleave to God's strength early on. And not have to get torn to pieces to figure it out. God doesn't use weak human strength. He uses His mighty power. It's available to us in fellowship in the divine dinosphere. That's the bottom circle. Or the unique life, spiritual life of the church age believer. Point three. Greatness demands maximum obedience to the Word of God. Maximum obedience comes through suffering, says Hebrews 5.8. It's amazing how many people play the game with God. And they'll... They'll come to church for a while. They'll get into Bible class. They'll learn a bit, a little bit. They learn just enough to get back into blessing. And God begins to pour. And they begin to get blessed. But they're just getting the trickle dose. And they say, okay, I've got the blessing. And they go out in life and they get distracted. And soon enough, they're disappeared. And then six months later, you see them again, and they got bruises and scratches all over their spiritual soul from going out and getting into discipline. And they left Bible class. And they left the only source of their prosperity, their blessing. And they got out under discipline. And then they got into enough pain well, they said, oh, I've got to get back to Bible class. And their whole spiritual life is bouncing back and forth between the two things, the little thimble cup of blessing and discipline out in a faraway land. Point four. Once this greatness is achieved, you learn the faith rest drill. And you've got occupation with Christ. You've learned to cleave to divine strength. You've learned obedience to God's Word. See, that's the greatness. Humanly speaking, you have become a crutch for the rest of the human race. You said, what? Humanly speaking, you have become a crutch for the rest of the human race. That's what happened to Joseph. He achieved the greatness, and now he is going to become a crutch. This greatness achieved in this way becomes a means of helping others in time of adversity. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. So he didn't use his power to be a dictator. He used his power to help.
It's amazing the short conversations that you have with people. We don't know the impact of it yet. But the super grace believer can hint at the pot of gold, and that's Bible doctrine. And so uh, it may be that you have some people who are interested, possibly, in uh, the source of truth that you've been able to um, find in Bible doctrine. And you may be able to hint at it, to insinuate that it's a mighty fine meal. And there may be some or some people who, who actually they see the prosperity that you have through Bible doctrine and they may say, I want some of that. And they may eventually join you. And I'm going to stop and tell you, do not ride a white horse and say that Bible doctrine is for everyone. It is not. Bible doctrine, while it was invented by God for every church age believer, it is not for everyone. It is for winners only. It is for winners only. And you will find out at Bema who the winners are. For the mature sons of God shall be revealed. So preparation for greatness involves discipline. There's your last ingredient. Discipline. We're talking about self-discipline. That means doing things that you do not like to do with the same fervor that you do things that you do like to do. And man, if there was ever a generation without discipline, it's the youngest one now. And it's the, because their parents didn't teach them. You put a kid in front of a video game, they have got laser beam concentration and skill like you would never believe. You put them behind a lawnmower and see what happens. It's in the dumper. And I'm not talking about my kids. My kids have some discipline. I'm talking about these youngest ones. Man, do they ever need parents that can teach them discipline. And I'll never forget hauling hay with my dad. You always hauled hay when it was the hottest. That was the rule of thumb. If you walked outside and it was extremely hot, You'd say to yourself, I bet Dad's going to want to haul hay. And sure enough, let's haul some hay, boys. And back then, you didn't have round bales. There was no round balers. First time I saw one of those, I was like, man, that is, that is some kind of miracle. Nobody is going to pick that roll of hay up ever. A tractor is going to do it the whole way. What has happened to my life? Because we used to go out in the hay field and Dad would throw the old truck down in low gear and it would just idle along with no driver. And we'd start chunking them bales. And sometimes they were full of briars. Sometimes they were baled green. And man, my dad, when he made a load, he wanted to get every bale you could on top of there. So when it got up pretty high, you had to really put some umph into it to get it up there. I couldn't get it up too high when I was young. Discipline. Nobody's ever going to be great without discipline. And that means they enter every task with the same intensity because they have some self-discipline. Whether it is digging a ditch or whether it's counting gold coins. See? It's all the same. You can't be great without self-discipline. Great people are people whose lives are well-ordered. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see God's discipline towards a believer, and we're talking about divine discipline. Take a child who has been properly disciplined. Greatness comes to him sooner or later because he has profited 
from the discipline, and he has built the scale of values around it. By the way, you cannot spoil your children by what you give them. You cannot spoil your children by what you give them. You spoil them by teaching, by them having the lack of respect. See, you keep them from being spoiled by teaching them respect. And in that way, there have been some very rich families who've been able to continue whilst giving their child everything they could possibly need. They have taught them respect every step along the way. Greatness in the sense of mentality comes from academic discipline. Very often there are academic subjects which are boring and difficult and require a tremendous scope of study, concentration, and categorizing. When one is able to put such a package together, he develops his mind in the categorical concepts, and out of it often comes greatness. Often such things can be built on discipline with regard to time, discipline with regard to difficult things in life. In every facet of life, great people are disciplined people. In Hebrews 12, 6, we see that God uses discipline to train believers. We see the results of that discipline in Hebrews 12, verses 11 through 5. And that's we, as we return home, by the way. So in the life of Joseph, when God gets ready to present a man and use an individual believer, everything combined in the human race can't stop it. Noting, nothing can pre uh, prevent an image if it is against God's will, and yet when God is ready, no one can stop it. David with the sheep is a perfect illustration. He was the last brother and not even in the military. And God said, that's the one. Pour the oil on him. So we come to the end of verse 1 and it says, And behold, he stood by the river. We should recognize this is the Nile River. And the Nile River is different from a lot of other rivers because it flows for such a long distance and through some very tropical places that its sources of water uh, are vast. And that at certain times of the year in Egypt, the river would just come out of the banks and it would haul all of the nutrients downstream from rich organic sources and it would deposit a new layer of decomposing uh, elements onto the soil. It was very rich uh, soil and the topsoil ran for hundreds of feet deep and uh, it was because of the flooding river and the, the, the tributaries of this river that uh, the fact that the drought would not touch, the famine would not touch Egypt. And we're going to see that this dream that Pharaoh has is of a famine that's going to last for seven years. And the reason that Egypt was not uh, destroyed by the famine is because it was located upon the Nile River, which flooded every season and brought not only its water, uh, for irrigation, but it also brought free fertilizer in every year. And so they were able to grow the grain. So the dream in verse 2, Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat. Now, 
there's a lot of different kinds of cows. And um, I can tell you, I want to tell you a cow story because I was raised around cattle and um, a lot of my prosperity came from cattle farmers because of my father's uh, occupation. So my dad tried to build a cattle herd and he wasn't a very good cow farmer and uh, but, but he did his best and he tried to wheel and deal and buy a few cows and not and maybe not tell my mom how much money he was spending and uh, he did he grew hogs on the side and he always took the scrap feed from the feed store busted bags stuff that got a little old and he fed that to the hogs and then he would take all of his meat hogs down to the butcher and he would sell those hogs and he made pretty good money because he wasn't having to pay for the feed and all he had to do was keep the fence up and make sure everybody was happy and do some deworming and things like that along the way and he made pretty good money and took a lot of that money and he invested into cattle well there was one cattle purchase that he just couldn't make out of his own pocket and he wanted to buy a nice fine bull he had a bunch of uh, cows and heifers uh, but he never had a good bull and whenever he wanted to have them bred he always would talk some neighbor into bringing their bull over and turning him loose in the pasture and then leave him for a while and he would make sure all the females were bred and then they'd pull the bull out and he'd have to pay for the service or what have you well he finally determined that he wanted a new bull and Keith Lawrence was the man's name and he had a farm and he raised bulls and he raised Herefords and these are the red and white ones that you see and they come from Europe and uh, Keith uh, he was known for uh, raising a Hereford bull that had one or two extra vertebrae in his back it looked like he was as long as a school bus and he had wide shoulders and wide hips and my dad just fell in love with Keith Lawrence's bulls and he just had to have one and so when he got some money in the bank account I don't know how he got it in there he went and he visited Keith Lawrence and he wrote a check out of my mom and dad's checking account for this super nice bull and I can't remember whether it was it was either twenty five hundred or five thousand dollars which was a lot of money at that time for a small farm and he bought the bull and the bull went in the pasture so it was out there like a big red stop sign where did this bull come from and then my mom found out how much money he spent on that bull and it was it was a war at the house I can't believe you spent that much money on a bull and there he is and he was just a big pet he was you could you could sit up on this bull's back and you could pet him and you could brush him and he would even let you catch the horse flies off of him most of them were too skittish for that and we always like to shove a pine needle through the horse fly and let him fly off real slow the only thing about this bull was you didn't mess with his horns he didn't like you grabbing his horns and I had a friend over at the house one day and I said I'm going to show out and I, I said watch this he doesn't like this and I grabbed him by his horn and he hooked and he caught me by my belt loop right there on my pants and he splatted me up against the barn and I just slid down the side and my buddy just laughed and he said is that what he does when you mess with his horn of course I didn't have any breath But a Hereford bull is a fine animal, and he has his merits, but he's not as good as some other bulls. And if you really want a fine bull, you want a crossbred bull. And you want to cross him with a, uh, a Brahma, which we call Brahma, but that's really not how he's if you get down deep down in the south they call him a brimmer 
And that's really far away from the prince pronunciation. But the Brahma bull, he throws a small calf. And so he's great for young uh, heifers. And you can turn him in with those and they don't have a problem having their first calf. But he's wild. He comes from the antelopes of Africa. And he, he, he's very close to if you start studying antelopes in Africa and you look at Brahma bulls, there's a few of them which you can't even tell the difference of by looking at them. And they are wild as they can be. You can't hardly keep them in a fence. My friend had a girlfriend that lived at Spring Hill, Arkansas, and her dad had a big Brahma bull. And he would move his female cows from one pasture to another. And he would open the gate and all the female cattle would come through. And the Brahma bull would stay in the old pen until he made sure all his females was through the gate. And then he would look at the farmer and he would run and jump the fence right in front of him. And there was an open gate right there just to let him know, I don't need a gate. That's a Brahma bull. So he's too wild to keep in a fence. So what are you going to do? You're going to cross him with a gentle breed. And not only that, you're going to cross him with a breed that brings the best money at the livestock market, and that is Angus. Angus cows bring the highest money as meat value. And so when you cross a Brahma and an Angus, you get a Brangus. And a Brangus is the uh, best cow. And so you take a Brangus and it has short hair. A Angus cow has long old hair and you can't really brush them out that good. They get curls in it and they don't look that slick but you cross it with a Brahma and the Brahma's got short hair and the Brangus cows have short slick hair and they don't have the huge hump on their back like a Brahma they just got a small hump and their ears don't hang down like a Brahma they're a little shorter they hang down some and so you really get the perfect cow in my opinion if you cross an Angus and a Brahma and I envision when Pharaoh saw the cattle come up from the river in his dream, there was seven Brangus cows come up out the river. I got more cow stories as we go through. Don't worry. It says suddenly in, uh, there come up out of the river seven cows, fine looking and fat. And they fed in the meadow. And there's nothing finer than watching fine cattle eat on a fine pasture. And um, my dad taught me a lot of things when I was a kid. I started working at the farm store when I was 13 years old. And <clears throat> one of the things that he, he always loved to help farmers, and he would say, if you want to increase the quality of your herd, you improve the ground that they are standing on. The number one way to increase the quality of your herd is to improve the ground they are standing on. And that starts with a soil test. And say, so get you a soil test and send it to the University of Arkansas and then come back and see me. They're going to tell you how much fertilizer to put out, how much lime. And they'll eat. once you do that, then all of your good grasses will start choking out all them weeds you got. They'll buy chemical yet. Buy your fertilizer and buy your lime. And then see what happens. And he helped a lot of farmers and he helped a lot of animals by this one truth. And when you see these cows standing in the meadow on the Nile River bank, they are feeding on the finest grass that would be available to any cow anywhere or the topsoil run, there's no telling how deep it was. The fertile delta of the Nile River with seven fat cows feeding on its banks. What a great vision. And uh, it's amazing that we have these things in the Bible. And uh, 
the fat cattle on the riverbank are a sign of prosperity. And we should recognize that still today, we are dependent upon God for the sun and the rain, a thin layer of topsoil, is all that's keeping us here. Logistical grace is the same now as it was then. Even though we have technology, the technology cannot save you. The technology cannot put food on your plate in times of drought and disaster. Only God can do it. And so prosperity today is the same as prosperity was in the days of Pharaoh. Joseph heard of the dream. Pharaoh had the dream. And uh, it's still a mighty fine dream if you ask me. We're going to stop at verse 2 and we'll come back to the rest of the dream next Wednesday.